Oh. You guys got it? We can get chat and got it on the recording for both Jean and Joan. Okay. And Joan or Jean or I'm sorry, G. Campbell. You can just oh Gloria. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Just so you know we're recording. I said, yeah, I said it was okay. I got it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay, so my name is Kat Hart. I'm the director here at the Loveland Business Development Center. We're partnering with the studio tour this year to do some training and education. And we've got the wonderful Franklin Taggart to share some of his amazing knowledge tonight. This is hopefully going to be a really interactive session that we're doing, um, kind of talking about social media strategy and breaking the algorithm. So I'm going to turn it over to Franklin. Franklin, do you want to introduce yourself and then I'll share the slides real quick? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I have a, I have an introductory, in, introductory slide that will be coming on at the end of the show. <laughs> but I'll just say that um, I've been a Facebook member since 2009. Twitter member since 2010, YouTube and uh, LinkedIn since 2011, and I've been struggling with Instagram since 2012. <laughs> I will not do TikTok, I will not do Snapchat, and I will not do Twitch. <laughs> I know about Clubhouse. I am. The newest thing. I'm on Clubhouse. <laughs> okay, so we've got Amelia watching the chat for us. So. Um, our Zoomers, if you do have you know questions or anything, um, please feel free to put them in the chat. That way we make sure we uh, address your questions as well. I'm gonna go ahead and share the slides. And get our, just close that, I'll drag it. Oh, I can't, there we go. Okay, perfect. And you've got a clicker there. <laughs> Franklin, take it away. Clicking on. How many of you are on Facebook? All right, everybody, you are too, all right. Uh, how many of you are on uh, LinkedIn? <laughs> how many of you are on Instagram? All right, how many of you are on Twitter? Just what I thought. <laughs> oh, you are on Twitter? All right, how much do you use it? All right, very good. Um, how many of you are on YouTube? Demio? All right, anybody here on Twitch besides Kat? <laughs> How did you know? Because you're a gamer. Gamers are on Twitch. Uh, anybody here on Snapchat? All right. Anybody here on TikTok? All right. Anybody here on Clubhouse? You're on Clubhouse? Am I the only one on Clubhouse? All right, good. Um, Anyone here on, what was the other one that I was talking about? I think I got them all, or I got most of them anyway. But the one thing that I wanted, oh, Pinterest, that's right. Pinterest? All right, very good. So we've got a pretty good cross section, but almost everybody here, I, I saw everybody's hand for Facebook and Instagram. So we're gonna be talking quite a bit about both of those tonight. Um, and we're gonna be talking a little bit about um, how to, get your social media um, going a little bit more smoothly and beneficially to you and to everybody online. So the first thing that I'd like to ask, all right, Kat, it doesn't like me. Didn't like me. Clicker problems. So how about if I just hit oh. the air? Oh, there we go. There we go. So my big question: Are we, are we on it? Is it going to work now? I'm going to use the arrows. Okay. How how are you spending your time on social? Now, this is the first question that we're going to answer, and we're not going to answer it right off the bat. So hold on to your answers just for a second. What I'd like you to think about is how much. All right, still not getting it. What's going on with you, Zoom? Well, I had that more just on the wrong one. Try that again. 
I want to ask you, how much intention do you have behind the posting that you do on social media? And how much impact is your social media having? Those are the two criteria that we're going to talk about tonight. There are probably a hundred other criteria that we could talk about, but we just don't have that kind of time. But I'd like you to think about it in terms of uh, intention and impact, because those two things really are kind of what help us to categorize the type of content that you put on social media. I have a matrix. The first kind of content that we're going to talk about is low intention and low impact. Now, the thing that's really interesting about this is that it's a general audience. It's not for specific group of people. It's just a general audience. So it's probably something that you would just throw out to all of your followers on a, on a platform. It's uh, the primary goal here is attention and visibility. We don't, we just kind of want to stay present in other people's faces. Um, the strategy here is largely unplanned. We don't have much of a goal. We don't have much of a, you know, idea of what we're doing. There's usually not an offer involved. It's usually just, um, you know, memes, pets, food pictures, kid pictures, random activities, and quotes. The response to these is usually pretty light, and the connection that's made through this is, is usually pretty superficial. All right. Now, high intention but low impact. Now, these are the ones that are usually specific, specifically promotional in nature without any kind of a real value exchange. Um, they're, they're kind of a hallmark is that you'll see a uh, a photo image that has a whole bunch of text on it with maybe some pictures of a really attractive package that you get to download. Um, but the, the audience for this is a specific audience. You are trying to reach people who are interested in your products and services. And um, the goal here is to inform and inspire them. We want them to get more interested in what's for sale. The strategy is planned. This is something that you do with some intention. It's like you know that the event is coming up. You know that the sale is coming up. You know that everything that you want them to do, you're going to ask them to do in this particular thing. And the response usually to these is fairly moderate at best. Um, a lot of people just scroll right past it when they see all the text on the photo. The response, or, or I'm sorry, the connection that is made in this type is a transactional connection, which means that you're really trying to set up some kind of a transaction in it. And it's the announcements, events, opportunities, offers, etc. So this is a good example of high intention and low impact posting. Low intention and high impact. The audience is general again. But the, the goal here is to create a stronger connection with people. Um, a lot of times, if you'll see something that you feel really strongly about sharing with, uh, with your friends, that would be something that would fit into this category. It's like you weren't planning on it. There was no you know, premeditation about it. You just found something that you found was interesting and valuable, and you shared it. So this is a low intention, but it's still a high impact. Um, the response again to this is usually pretty moderate, although it can it can get heavy if it's really on target. And the connection that's made is that this is memorable to people. They, this is something that they remember. Now, some examples of this is when you share your passions, when you share the things that you're passionate about, when you share your point of view about something. This is another piece that fits into that category. If you have insights that you share with people, uh, particularly, you know, uh, insights that are kind of close to your, close to your heart, um, close to your expertise, those kinds of things, and celebrations and things of that nature, tributes. Um, these are things that uh, would probably not have a whole lot of planning behind them, and they probably don't have a real specific goal but they do create a stronger connection. And then the last kind of content that we can talk about is high intention. Uh -oh. Hey, Billy. 
I'm great now that you're here. Not sure what happened. There we go. High intention and high impact content. The audience on this is very specific. There's a specific group of people that you're trying to reach. The goal here is service. You're actually trying to deliver value in the post itself. And the strategy, there is a plan behind this. There's a very strong intention behind it. The response here is usually energetic and ongoing. This is, these are the kinds of posts that actually spur discussions. They create a, a, a high level of interaction. And the connection is that there's an exchange of value here. There's really, you're actually putting value on the table through your posts, all right? Now, some of the ways that this is done is through sharing your expertise, um, initiating discussions, and making a difference for people on the other end. Now, the thing that's really interesting is that if you look through your content on your social media, most of it's gonna fall into one of these four categories. And what I'd like you to think about now is your own score. What percentage of time do you spend on each kind of posting on your social media? And try to, try to come up to 100%. See if we can make it add up to 100. But if you think about low intention and low impact posting, what percentage of your social media time is spent? Again, that's things like memes, pets, uh, first day of school, um, random activities, uh, what you had for lunch, what you're fixing for dinner, just kind of randomly posted throughout the day. Then the high intention and the low impact kind is <clears throat> like when you're doing promotional things and it's just strictly promotion there's not really any kind of a value that's being put forth in the post itself, but you're really trying to promote something and get people's attention for that. A low intention, but high impact would be like really um, thoughtful sharing of things that you find online that are, you feel are helpful or valuable. Um, this, this also could be where you're recognizing people, uh, paying tribute to people, um, celebrating people. Um, once a week on LinkedIn, I do a one man standing ovation uh, where I recognize the, the accomplishments of somebody that's in my friends group or in my following there. And that's a, I don't, the only thing that I plan is that it's going to happen. Um, and then high intention and high impact. This is where we're actually trying to use our posts as a way to deliver value to people on the other end. So, how many of you, well, I'm going to, I'm going to rephrase this. What was your strongest? What was the one that you spend the most amount of time in? For us, I would say high intention. Okay. And how, how, how does that show up for you? What are the things that you're doing there? We work with clients. So there's the process and the That process. Right, so you're creating uh, creating attention for your product. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. And, and interest in the product. Creating interest in the product. Very good. What needs to come from that? Right. Other strong suits. And what was what was the one that you spent the most time? It used to be slideshows, but kind of like the keys, and I don't know if they're still there. Will it show a progression of the pieces? Yeah. The progressions are still up there, but you really have to dig for them. The progression videos, yeah. But um, one of the things that I know that you do really well, Billy, is that you celebrate sales, and that would be in that uh, low intention but high impact because it just reinforces that people buy your art. Other strong ones. Okay. Because, like, I probably post about like my personal life about ten percent of the time, and like my art and business ninety percent of the time. Yeah. I would say that 
that like maybe 20% of that is like targeted, like come to this event or I have this sale or whatever. Okay. So I guess does everything else that I'm doing fall under low end? I don't know. Like, it's hard to say, right? Right. What's really interesting is that for most people, the majority of their posting is low intention and low impact. It's random. It's we use social media this way. It's like we have our phone. We just share whatever picture we just took. We talk about what we just ate. We share what the kids are doing today. We share what this is at. So the majority of people spend most of their time doing the low and low. There's not a problem with that. That's still an important part of social media. All four quadrants are important. Now, what's usually the case, though, is up in the high and the high, generally, we don't have people spending as much time up there. And that's the one that actually has the most opportunity for high impact on the people that follow. So one of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight is defeating the algorithm or busting the algorithm or playing with the algorithm. And one of the ways that that happens is by making sure that you're delivering not only the great stuff that's through the day and the great stuff that's promotional and the great stuff that's celebratory, but we also want to deliver some value there too. So there are a lot of ways that that can be done. And that's something that we're going to talk more in detail about tonight. But for most of the people that I've worked with, that top right quadrant of high, high intention and high impact is the one that usually has the lowest score. Now, Billy, one of the things that's interesting, you brought up the progressive videos. That progressive video actually could fit in that category because it's showing your process. It's showing your expertise, right? So that's something to consider. It's anything that shows your expertise fits in that upper right-hand corner. So, so if you're just sharing your finished piece, is that sharing your expertise or that's really not because you're just putting out this is what if you're showing it as a part of your process, yes. If you're showing that process isn't included, it's more than anything else. It's probably it would fit more in the promotional category, or or it might be in the in the celebratory category where you're really trying to, you know, be excited that you finished something. Yeah. But even though I don't find those videos anymore, I still sometimes will put my start. When I'm starting, yeah. and it'll just be pretty much a rough sketch. And I might still call it a work in progress. I'm just getting through some things. And I wait until I get a professional shot before. So, what I want to make, make sure you internalize here is that there isn't a bad and a good here. They're all important, they all play their part. We make connections through social media, through all of these things. And the connections are everything from superficial to fairly deep in different, different settings. But social media, we have the ability to do all of those things. And very often, the things that we do tend to be the ones that are the easiest and the ones that uh, kind of fit into the convenient uh, category of how they fit into our day. Where we, you know, this upper right-hand corner does take some time and deliberation and some planning. And we'll talk a little bit about how that can be facilitated in the content that you create. So, were there any surprises? No surprises? Didn't think so. So the top three complaints about social media. I'm not sure how social media works or how to use it. I'm overwhelmed by not knowing what to share and when. And nobody sees or reacts to my posts. All right. So there are thousands of problems and complaints about social media. These just happen to be the favorites. So those are the ones that we're going to spend our time with tonight. And what we're going to look at is that the top three complaints actually reveal three problems. For the first one, I'm not sure how social media works or how to use it. The problem is that we're not using it strategically. Um, there is a strategy that can be put in place. In fact, there are many strategies that can be put in place. 
The problem in the second one is that we have too many options and many of them are bad. The uh, example that I'll give is that most people got trained on Facebook by putting in text-based posts. Well, those are the ones on Facebook that Facebook ignores. So it's not a really a great option, right? So we've got to kind of keep track of the options that we need and we have to have kind of a, an understanding of which content really reaches more people. And then if nobody is seeing or reacting to your posts, what, what that means is that you're not playing by the algorithm's rules. And we're going to talk more in detail about what the algorithm is a little bit later, but all of the social media platforms have an algorithm. Some of them are more stringent than others. Google has algorithms that are crazy. Um, and all, all of our all of our relationships at this point online are being managed by algorithms. And what we have to learn how to do is to play by their rules. And, um, and that will increase the visibility of our posts and it will increase the impact and it will make us happy. Did you know that you were gonna get happiness tonight? <laughs> I'll just reevaluate right there, that's high impact. <laughs> that's high intention. <laughs> so we have three learning goals tonight. We're going to go from having no strategy or an ineffective strategy to having a clear strategy that works. We're going to go from content confusion to confident content creation. And we're going to go from feeling invisible and disconnected on social media, to being fully visible and frequently viral in the best sense. <laughs> Let's see what happens when you increase your intention and your impact. That's the goal for tonight. Now, the first thing that we're going to talk about is social media strategy. And social media strategy has some uh, predictable components, no matter which platform you're using. And the first one is that your strategy needs to have a goal. Now, there are different kinds of goals that you can have for social media. Like, for instance, one of the goals would be to just form better relationships with people. Relationship goals are a big reason that social media exists. You could also have um, a, a goal for professional visibility and positioning and something that's going to support your reputation in the role that you want to be known in. So this would be uh, where social media gets used for branding and for things like uh, ha having people uh, understand what you do and why. Um, that's a really good way to use social media. So that could be a goal as well. Another goal could be that you just want to generate interest in what you make. Another goal is that you want to sell more of what you make. So the thing that we need to look at is what is the what is the goal that you have for your social media? Now, when I say that out loud, what are the first things that come to mind for you? What are the what are the first goals that come to your mind for your social media use? Interest. Creating interest. Yeah. Okay. And uh, primarily Instagram, or are you? Um, Instagram, Facebook as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. How much are you using TikTok? Um, I was using it for a good amount of time, but the I'm probably posting twice a week. Not much. Um, okay. For a while, but the algorithm is my butt. So <laughs> Yeah, they started to started to push you under a little bit. Okay. Yeah, that's one of the things that happens is that if you get in too repetitive of a pattern with your posting, like if you post too much of the same thing over and over and over and over again, mm -hmm. you'll start to see your rankings and your interactions tumble. Mm -hmm. So, that, and that happens on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, uh, some somewhat on YouTube. Um, LinkedIn is the kindest when it comes to that. What's Like, let's say that I post a picture of something that I've made 
every day of the week for months. The same thing. What I'll see happen is that at not the beginning, the same picture, not the same picture, it's just the same same kind of picture, or it could be the same kind of a like. There are a lot of people that have their um, have their accounts set up to automatically post memes daily, or they'll post quotes, inspirational quotes daily. Well, what happens is at the beginning of that pattern, they'll see a lot more interaction with those posts. But as they continue to do it over and over and over and over again, they'll see a decline in the engagement that they get from those posts because they've been posting the same thing over and over again. Now, is that due to the algorithm or is that due to just user interaction? Both. Oh. Remember that the algorithm rewards user interaction. So if people are no longer interacting with your posts, the algorithm picks that up and it won't let more people see it. What if they do like it? If, if you post the same thing over and over again, say that you're a really great artist and you mm -hmm. just post a bunch of um, paintings and it just grows as far as interest, but yet it's still the same type you, of a quote. You probably won't see as much of a hit as long as people are interacting with it. But people like variety. I don't know. I don't know about you, but after a while, if I see the same thing over and over and over again, the likelihood that I'll scroll past it and not stop, which is what the algorithm pays attention to, becomes more likely. Yes. Can you give an example of interaction? You said scrolling and stopping. Is it also clicking, uh, commenting, liking? Or... Yeah. Yeah, the question is uh, what are the things that uh, are noticed by the by the algorithm. The amount of time that you spend on a post is really the first thing that it notices. If you stop, like if, if you stop scrolling on your phone, Facebook notices that, all right? If you say out loud, like I just, I just saw it happen today. If you say out loud, hmm, I wonder what's for lunch at Chipotle today. And then the next thing that you see on Facebook is a Chipotle ad. They're listening, they're watching, they're looking at your behaviors. And um, that's part of the trade-off that we have for being on these services, is that they are really studying the way that we interact and behave. So they're gonna notice if you stop scrolling, they're gonna notice if you, if you take enough time to read something, they're gonna notice if you click the little see more uh, button at the bottom of a post that that only that you only see the first two lines. They're going to notice how long you stay on that post. They're going to notice if you take any actions from that post. Like, are you clicking on a link? Are you um, are you sharing that post? Are you liking that post? Or are you commenting on that post? Now, the other thing that they're going to pay attention to is do discussions get started based on the comments. So one of the things that they'll like is that if you keep coming back to a post to, to stay engaged in discussions in the comments, they're going to let more people see that post. Yeah. Yeah, all the reactions have that. Not just like that, if you're like, hey, thanks so much, you know, yeah. you will comment on all those beautiful paintings or whatever you do, you'll see a lot more activities than if you just like their comments. We're going to talk a lot more about that when we get to the algorithm part, um, but I'll, I'll keep going on strategy because that part of the strategy is getting, getting past the algorithm. So the next thing we need to look at, oops, two things is we need to look at which channels we use. Now, it used to be possible to really manage more than one channel effectively, but that was back when you had three options on Facebook and not 100. That was when you had two options on Instagram and not 12. That, you know, every one of the platforms has added feature after feature after feature after feature. And when I first got on Facebook, we had three options. You could share a text post, you could share a photo or you could share an audio message. Well, they did away with the audio message in favor of video a few years back. 
Now you can do live video. Now you can do stories. Now you can do photo albums. Now you can do like video series. Now you can do uh, uh, the Facebook Watch program where you can get your you can get your videos seen across the platform. You've got more options now than you ever had on social media. So we have to be a little bit more choosy about the channels that we're on because we don't have the bandwidth at all to manage all of those channels. I can't do it. I've, I've let go of Twitter. I've let go of what I thought I had on Instagram. Um, and I've, I've really tapered down the activity that I do on Facebook. Most of my activity on Facebook now is interaction in groups. I'm hardly on my timeline at all. I very rarely get on there to post anything unless I've got a new podcast to announce or maybe an event coming up, but I'm hardly ever on my timeline. And I, I have my, actually my computer is set up to go directly to groups and not to my timeline so that I can go to groups and check in there first, because that's where I'm getting the most of my favorable results. That's where my goals are more likely to happen. So I've chosen Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups as my primary social media uh, arenas. And everything else is secondary to that. So the thing that you're going to be looking at in your strategy is which channel makes the most sense for you. Now, even within the platform, you might find that there's a better channel than others. Like I've got a lot of people that are on Instagram, especially artists. And one of the things that they're finding is that they're getting a lot more response from reels and collections than they are from just posting in the timeline. Reels are just short videos. Uh, collections are like albums of, of images that, that you can see, and they can be played in slideshow form or they can just be frame by frame. And people like the interactive ones. So one of the things that's really interesting is that on Instagram, if you're, if you're still posting to the timeline, but you're seeing a lowering in the number of people that are that are interacting with you. You're probably going to find that you need to, to find another more interactive way to be on Instagram. Um, so choosing a channel is an important piece. The way that I've been working is that Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups are my primary channel. Um, I put announcements on Twitter that are automated whenever I've got a new podcast or a new video on YouTube or something like that. YouTube is where I do a lot of, I, I consider YouTube my primary content channel now because I'm putting my podcast there and I'm putting my instructional videos there. But, um, and then my podcast is the other channel that I devote my time to. I don't have time for any of the rest of them. And so I'm just gonna let them go. I don't feel compelled to be on every social media platform all the time and lose my wits. I think some of you can relate, right? So that said, the next thing that we want to look at in our strategy is the activity. And I just mentioned, I found that groups are the best activity. That's the most profitable activity that I can be involved in as a coach. But what you may find is that your best activity happens, you know, with a, a Facebook shop or a Facebook marketplace, or now Instagram has shopping on it too. You may find that selling your products, you do better in some kind of a marketplace environment. So we need to find the place where your activities are really going to have the best payoff for you um, in your business, right? The other thing that's a really big part of your social media strategy is your message. Now, a lot of times what happens is, and I've noticed this with a lot of the artists that I've worked with, is that they're really, really strong on the imagery. They're really strong on the visual. But when it comes to writing a message about that visual, it's really difficult or it doesn't, doesn't necessarily support the image and the, and the quality of the image. So one of the things that I think is really important for us is to really learn how to write clear messages, no matter what we're trying to do. And the type of message that I think is most important on social media is a persuasive message. Now, this isn't where we're trying to sell something all the time, but it is something where we're trying to increase the interaction that we have with people as we go. Um, in just a minute, I'll talk a little bit about that. But learning how to write really good, clear messages about what you're posting image-wise 
is going to boost your your interaction it's going to boost your visibility and it's going to boost your favorability of the algorithm if you have anyone's attention you need to make an offer i want you to notice that you have one of my business cards in front of you Turn the business card over to the back. There's a QR code there, but there's also just a, a little short message that says, if you feel stuck in your career, your business, or your life, schedule a call. It's no cost to offer. The only thing it's going to cost is an hour of your time. But it's there. And it, the thing that's really interesting is that we give our business cards out frequently. And it, if there's not an offer there, it may be a wasted opportunity. So one of the things that you could think about is what is it that you could put on there that would be a really cool offer to someone who maybe has never purchased something of yours before? You know, it, it might be a discount. I don't usually encourage discounts, but it could be uh, it could be something where you give them a, a, an offer where they buy one and get something special or they have some kind of a premium that they can get or, you know, uh, a couple of examples that I've seen uh, is that uh, there's um, oh, what's her name? names are going. Um, well, shoot, Describer. what's that? Describer. Um, yeah, we probably are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, basically, no. Basically, what she offers to do is that for every painting that she sells, she offers to help them to to hang it in their home so that it'll be the most attractive. So it's, it comes with a free hanging, and um, she'll also give them a discount off the frame. It'll come to me. It'll come to me when I'm like driving home tonight. But anyhow, if you can, if you can consider any time that you've got a person's attention, why don't you make an offer? And the offer doesn't have to be making a sale. The offer is just simply another step in the relationship with this person who is interested in what you're putting out there. So. Um, it could be something as, as simple as um, I'm, I'm getting ready to participate in the Loveland Studio Tour, and um, I've got a special offer for people who visit my studio after seeing this post. Why don't you do a screen save of this post, bring it to my studio, and you'll get a, you, you'll get a special uh, benefit. Right? That's an offer. An offer could be something as much as um, I would love to, you know, just spend some time uh, hearing about all of the art that you've ever bought. I'd love to, you know, make a connection with you. And so that's the thing that I think we need to look at is that an offer is not specifically for a sale. An offer is for the next step in the relationship with the customer. We, we want to honor that relationship. It's everything. We don't want to rush the sale. We don't want to shy away from the sale, but we want the sale to be perfectly timed. And one of the ways that we can do that is by stair-stepping our offers so that the relationship will support the sale. That makes sense? What would you offer if you had, if you were, uh, if you were posting on Facebook tonight, what would be a really good offer that you could make to people? Well, something that <clears throat> occurred to me, maybe nobody would care, but what I found talking to people that are looking at art, if you offer to take some extra time and provide kind of the story behind that. Yeah. And a couple of your steps that you did in that particular thing. I mean, you could make that generally available, but sometimes there's something that somebody's interested in that has this particular story that's way more interesting than putting out there for everyone. Yeah, you do that. I do that all the time. Yeah. yeah. I bought a piece of Amelia's last couple of years ago, and it's uh, Peaks. And um, on the back of it, she's got this really cool little story. And that makes it just that much more meaningful. You're right. That is, that could be an offer. Absolutely. It adds value. It, it creates a deeper connection with people when they understand a little bit more about your reasons for what you do, right? Okay, any other offers come to mind before we move on? I love that. Sign me up. 
<laughs> Billy? Billy? Yeah. And it's a beautiful thing. They, it helps them to feel like they're on the inside, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's another type of connection. It makes them feel like that they're, you know, that there's some closeness there. Yes. Probably the best offer, the best response I've had to an offer was when I was doing a painting and I kind of put out a call to anyone who like related to the message of that painting and told them that I would paint their name into the painting. And I had like yeah. 40 people respond to that. So an offer of personalization made a huge difference then. That's really cool. That, that's actually a great story. That one you probably ought to write down and let other people know about because it's a really good idea. But all those 40 people, That's really cool. They're Amelia, did you? Oh. Each other, so you can't, like, distinguish sure. the individual names, but they're all there. Yeah. Yeah, any kind of downloadable. Like, like what? Um, could be like a phone wallpaper. Like oh, okay. maybe it's, you know, something just to kind of spice up the imagery on your phone. Um, or like some of the things that I've been playing around with. You take an area of expertise that you have, maybe, you know, um, maybe it has something to do with your process. And then you um, condense it into a simple, like, letter size downloadable thing for, for somebody be, to be able to, to get for free. And then, um, like... One of the ones that I did right now, I did a series um, of downloadables based on collecting art yeah. that you that you absolutely love. And, and I came at it from my perspective as a collector. I, I was not interested in necessarily selling my own. I just wanted to share my own experience with, like, this is how I've collected art. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm on a serious budget here, yeah. you know, so, <laughs> but just letting people know it's, it's definitely doable. There's ways to go about it. And if you've never done it before, here's how you start. Yeah. Um, and like things like that, people find really, really valuable. That's a great idea. Kat? When I was doing my custom dresses, um, an offer that comes to mind that I would always do would be to work with their measurements and then tell them, okay, based on your body shape, these are the kind of things you should look for in clothing in the future when you're not buying from me. Yeah. So that it was easier for them to pick out stuff off the rack that would fit their body type. Because I worked with a lot of women that were non-traditional body types. Wow. So. <laughs> That's a great offer. You're right, right on target. Down, um, downloadables, I've done like uh, bookmark. Yeah. Just or, or gift tags. There's a couple that I'll send out like with my newsletter. Very good. Now, another thing that you can offer is collaborations. And one of the things that I've seen be a very powerful combination is when artists and poets or artists and authors uh, come together and the artist invites the author or the poet to put words to their image. Then they create a, a composite of the two, and then they post that. So what happens there is their audience gets it, and your audience gets it, and as a result, it's get it gets seen by more people, and it also there's there's this really cool effect that happens when we when we enhance art with another kind of art. Um, I, I host a concert series at the Museum of Art in Fort Collins where we match music with the, with the artist that's currently on, exi on exhibit there. And that experience is something that actually has sold more of the music and more of the art. And those are some kinds of things to remember is like when you find those kinds of creative collaborations, that can be a way of building relationships with a much larger audience actually quite fast, right? So the last thing that we want to consider on our strategy is action. The action, again, it's not just sell stuff. The action could be, I'm going to be having an open house. You just had one in your backyard. Um, 
I'm going to be having an open house, meet the artist, uh, see my new work. It's a VIP reception. Um, everybody's welcome. Come on out. Please RSVP so we have enough food. Um, it doesn't have to be asking for a sale. It can be um, in, an invitation to an event. It can be an invitation uh, for feedback. One of the things that we used to do, I used to run, uh, Billy took part in this, the audience workshop. You remember when we were talking about what having people come in and look at your painting and give three words that describe their perception of the painting. Well, what does that do? First of all, they're spending more time with that painting than they ever have, ever would, or ever will. And that's the thing is like, we have a better shot at moving and selling the work that we do if people spend more time with it. So one of the things that we can do with our social media is create opportunities for people to actually have a more deeply engaging experience with the art that we make. When we call people to action, Let's call them to that experience. Let's make the experience more deep. Any questions or thoughts there? So actually, that would be download the Click here. Click here. Is it here? Or call. Or subscribe. Sign as a donation. So you can go to sign yourself. Yep. You've got it. Anything that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, people are generally pretty pretty easy with their opinions. You just have to be okay with all of their opinions. You yeah. can just like say, I'm gonna listen to all these opinions and then go, nope. Uh, <laughs> now there's one last thing that I'm not gonna say is optional, but one of the things that you need to do is start measuring what works and what doesn't. And Facebook makes that fairly easy. Um, they're, they're hiding it again from us in, in this thing called Facebook Business Manager. But Facebook Business Manager and Instagram are linked together for business pages. So you can find all of your Facebook information and your Instagram information in the same place. But what we want to look at is what are the things that are really landing for people? And what is it that's making that happen? What are, what are the things that they're reacting to or responding to? So we want to come up with some ideas of measurement that's meaningful. And I think that the, the measurement really needs to be mostly meaningful to you. Like, for example, I'm not one that I get too bent out of shape about sales, but what I do really like is when I get discussion threads going on. So if I see a post that has four or five really good discussion threads happening, that's something that I look for. That, Something about that post created the, the level of interaction that I want. My biggest frustration online is that I'm not satisfied with most of the interaction. That I, I want to go deep. Social media doesn't facilitate it very well. You might have to do a free offer. Talk to you with Franklin via Zoom. Yeah, they don't like that. They don't like that either. <laughs> But anyhow, so when you're putting together your social media strategy, these, these components, these seven things, will make sure that you've got all of the different things in place that you need to have a more effective uh, result on social media. If any one of these things is missing or hobbled, you'll notice a difference. Like if you go out there and you're, you know, you're putting really good activity out there, but your message isn't clear, people aren't going to interact with what you do. It's going to get one round of, of views and then it's going to be buried. So if your messaging can, be, can really get on target, that can mean a lot for the number of people who see and the number of people who interact. And that's what the algorithm loves to see. So what do you mean by messaging? Do you mean by the comments that you put um it could be the the like on facebook when you post an image you also have the ability to post a message with that image it's right text. it's just Content. it's text but in the message you can tag people in the message you can put hashtags in the message you can also say things like 
you know, this piece took about 36 hours of my time from beginning to end. And there were about three times when I was ready to throw it against the wall. But actually this morning, I really love it. You've just made it a little bit more personal and a little bit more interesting, right? So your messaging, that's one place that you can do a message. The thing that's really cool on Facebook is that you can do captions on everything and you can put tags in captions too. So it's like Facebook gives you all these different places where you can put text in. Now, here's the thing that you got to understand about text. It's searchable. Text is searchable. So if you, you know, if you're putting text on there, it makes your posts come up in searches more frequently. Right? So if you're just putting images up, that's a beautiful thing. And those three people that see it are going to like it, but you could be seen by a lot more people. Right. When I post about right on the town, I usually tag several businesses where they can have dinner or have yeah. drinks, and I tag those businesses. Their followers see it, so it's it really snowballs. Yeah, tagging is one of the things that that I, I think everybody needs to understand better. We don't have. We could probably do a whole workshop just on tagging, but that's the right idea. It's like you're you're expanding the reach of your post just by including their audience. Yeah, you're promoting them too at yeah. the same time. And most of the time they appreciate that. <laughs> so now let's talk about your post strategy. What we talked about high intention and high impact social media. Let's talk about high intention social media. When you write a post First of all, determine what is your goal. Now, the thing that I like to do here is I like to come up with a specific goal. Like this, this particular post, I would really like to read this to result in 10 visits to my website. Now, the cool thing with my website is that I can look at my website and see where the visits came from. And if they came from this post, I can tell if I've been successful or not. So I want this post to generate 10 visits to my website. I want this post to result in um, a really good discussion about uh, the plight of artists right now on Twitter, whatever. I just want to have a goal. I don't want to just go in there and say, here's another picture of my kids. Here's another picture of my Yorkie, isn't he cute? They get a lot of reactions and stuff like that, but so what? <laughs> so figure out a goal for your post before you write it. So you have a good point there as far as measurability. Pick a number. Yeah. Um, don't just be like, I just want engagement. That's not helpful. You need yeah. some kind of number for that engagement. My goal for this is 50 likes or 50 reactions. It could be likes, loves, sads, happies, care. <laughs> <laughs> All the different Facebook reactions that you can have. I just want to get 50 reactions out of this post and see what happens. Now, um, I'm going to pick on Billy again. A few years ago when we were doing the studio tour preparation, I said, set a sales goal. You'll be surprised if you set a sales goal. And it doesn't have to be monetary. It doesn't have to be a number of dollars that you make. It could be just the number of pieces that you sell. And what was really interesting in follow up is that I would go back and the people who actually set a really clear sales goal met or exceeded that goal in most of the cases. And the people who didn't, didn't have as great of an experience. So setting a goal, there's something about it. I'm not going to say that it's magic or woo woo, but there is something energizing about setting a goal that helps things perform better. Now, make, what's that? It's intentional. That's the intention, right? Yeah. <laughs> so make sure that you set a goal. Identify specifically who is it for. Now, one of the things that you could do is you can actually make this kind of fun. Um, this is for roly poly plumbers who have plumbers crack. So I'm going to construct my message so it's for guys who have their pants halfway down. All right. I'm going to do this one for the mother who just shouted at her children in the car. I'm going to do this one for. Uh, the person who is so burned out in their job that they're ready to just scratch their eyes out. 
So the thing is, is like if you can if you can imagine a specific person and then message to that person, your messages actually have a lot more relevance. And it's not that everybody fits that category. But you could just say, I was just thinking this morning about the about the mother whose kids are uh, are back in school. And I was kind of worried about her because she's thinking about her kids all day and she's having a hard time concentrating and getting her work done. So here is something that I've created just for that mother. Check this out. Boom. Now, can you feel the difference between that? And here's the, the here's the cut that I made this morning. Right. So if you can if you can actually craft your post to a specific kind of person, not necessarily a specific person, but a specific kind of person, it helps your message to be a lot more clear. What is the role that you want to be perceived in? Um, and, and this is another one where you can be anything that you want to be in your posts. You know, today I am putting on my life coach hat and I am telling you that if you really want your life to be better today, you need to do these three things. And here's my post. Buy more art, <laughs> buy my art, buy this piece of art. It's on sale right now at Independence Gallery for $3,500. I mean, understand what your role is that you're putting out there. It's like uh, a lot of times people really respond well when you come across really clear about who you are. And even if it's a hat that you're putting on for five minutes, it doesn't matter. Your message is going to come from that place and it's going to be something that they can actually grasp and react to and respond to and hold on to, right? So one of the things that's really interesting is that I've, I have a couple of clients who are really, really wonderful artists, but I would be willing to bet that most of their Facebook following doesn't know that they're artists. And the reason is because they're posting all of their other activities on Facebook. They're posting what they do at church. They're posting the things that they cook. They're posting the things that they do for their children. They, they don't have any concept of showing up as an artist, but they're brilliant. And it's just, I don't know if it's something that it's like an inner catch or if it's something that's just not a habit yet. But one of the things that you can show up as is a brilliant artist that needs to be recognized as such. This is my art. It matters. You want to post your lasagna, why not post your painting? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Lasagna's brilliant too, but this painting. So the thing is, when you're when you're creating your social media posts, think about what role you want people to perceive you in through that post, right? What do you want them to know? Now again, you can you can get kind of technical about this if you want to. This was painted on a 32 by 32 canvas that I bought at Jerry's Artorama. And um, it was painted with uh, this particular set of brushes and this particular set of paints. Um, and it was primarily three colors, but I blended them into six. Um, and that was about it. Or you could go a little bit more personal and you could say, um, I was really deeply inspired on my walk this morning. I know Billy, you do this a lot. Um, I took some pictures, I'm going to take these and I'm going to make some paintings out of them. Um, anything that you can do in terms of helping them to know more about you and what goes into your work is going to be a bonus, right? So think about what is it that you want them to know about what you're showing them? What went into it? One of the things that I was telling people to do on their artwork is not only on the price tag, don't put just the price, put in the number of hours that you worked, put in the cost of your materials, put in the number of hours that you practiced, put that on your price tag too, and see if people start to perceive the value differently, right? So it's, it's one of these things where, what do you want people to know in your post? What do you want them to know about that piece of work that they're seeing? Now, what do you want them to do? Do you want them to come see the painting somewhere in person? 
Is there a place where they can see it in person? Do you want them to come to your website where you have like a full high definition uh, photo that they can look at and they can zoom in on, and they can zoom out on, and they can have a really cool experience of it? What do you want them to do next? What is the thing that you would like these folks to, to, to take action on? Now, again, this could be a sale, but it doesn't have to be. Now, one of the things that I usually tell people is that if you're going to be displaying art in your social media feed, one piece of information that you need to have there is the place where they can buy it. Because what's really interesting is that if you eliminate any steps that they have to take to make the decision to buy your art, you're, you're closer already. So if you're putting images on social media of your artwork, make sure that you put a place that they can access it and buy it. And if, it, if, it's, if it's one click away, that's even better, right? So I know a lot of folks who, um, who use Fine Art America and they can say, this image is available uh, for print on Fine Art America, here's the link, boom. And it, you can send them there. Now, Facebook, I know Facebook has some problems with putting external links on posts, but if you're doing the other work and you get interaction on your links, or if you get interaction on your posts, that's not going to hurt you so much. If you, if you just put a link on there and just let it sit, Facebook will bury it. But if you're getting the interaction happening, and we're going to talk about a specific strategy later on, there's a really good way around that the links won't be a hindrance. But the other thing that I'm a big fan of, are, are any of you familiar with a thing called Linktree? Do you use Linktree? Yeah. Um, any, anyone else use Linktree? Right. <laughs> Linktree is a really interesting thing and it was developed, I don't know if you know on Instagram, you're only, a, you're only allowed to have one live link on Instagram and it's in your description. Most people put their website in there but what Linktree is, is a third party website that allows you to set up uh, buttons that you put your Linktree link in your Instagram feed. And when people click on it, some buttons come up with different options. So on mine, I have it set up so that it can go to my podcast, it can go to my YouTube channel, it can go to my website, it can go to my calendar link so that they can schedule their free one hour call. It, I think I have five options on there. But one of the things that you can do with Linktree is you can set it up so that it's really easy for people to find your Fine Art America page, your Etsy site, your Shopify page on your website, wherever it is that you've got your stuff available online, you can set up a Linktree link to go there and all they have to do is push a button to get to that place. So the thing that I'll say is that tools like Linktree just make it really easy for you to to send people places. So one of the things that I've been doing lately is I've been putting Linktree, you know that blue button on your Facebook page? That's the call to action button. You can program that to go to any link online. Put your Linktree link in there and you can have as many different buttons as you want that go to different places where you can send people to buy your stuff. So instead of sending, instead of putting your link in your Facebook post, you're saying, click on my blue button and then go to my Fine Art America page. And it's in this collection, boom. You're getting them there. You're eliminating a step for them. And it's more likely that they're gonna buy if those steps are eliminated. So think about the action that you want them to take and make it easy for them to do. There's the specific next step. Don't give them a don't give them a menu of steps if you can help it. Like sign up for my email list, uh, follow me on everything. Um, you know we don't want to we don't want to give them more than one option, one action, one one option. That's it. So it's like to to see this in more detail, click this link and go to my website. To, to uh, purchase this, uh, to purchase a print of this, go to my Fine Art America page. You know, but one action, just one action. Keep it simple. So when you're creating your posts on social media, try to, try to incorporate these six things. Cool? Any questions on that before we move ahead?
Kat, are we eight o'clock or eight thirty? All right. How are you all doing? Do you need a stretch? You mind if I just keep going then? Awesome. Mm -hmm. I'd like to talk really briefly about content categories. I've come up with five categories that are just kind of broad, but one of the things that I think is really important when it comes to generating content for your social media and a place where a lot of people get stuck is they don't know what to do. Well, there are a lot of things that you can post on social media, but one of the things to remember is that we're trying to build relationships here and the relationships can be formed in a lot of different ways. But the content that we put up there, the goal of the content really is to develop a, a better relationship with our client. So one of the things that we can share on social media are our interests. You know, if it's connected to your artwork, that's great. If it's not connected to your artwork, that's great too, because that helps you to be seen as more of a well-rounded human. Right? It's not just about business, business, business all the time. I do this too, you know? So sharing your interest is a good thing. Sharing inspiration is a good thing. Now, one of the things that I really think is a helpful thing for artists to do is to talk about the influences that they've had. And in some cases, you can talk about the influences, you can talk about the influence that you've had. You just say, this person was a student of mine, and it was really fun to see this happen, you know? So inspiration can come in a lot of forms. Um, a lot of people think that hearing the Gandhi quote, uh, being the change that you wish to see in the world, is really important for everybody to hear all the time. <laughs> Not so much. It's become a cliche, and it's actually become, it's become something that people scroll past. We want to be really sure that our inspiration is original. And if you can be, if you can actually be the source of that inspiration, I think it's better for you. Insights. Everybody has their own set of insights and no two sets are the same. It makes life rich for us to share insights with each other. I just realized, oh my gosh, in the Sistine Chapel, God and Adam are inside of a giant brain. <laughs> wow. And then what happens next? Discussion and what? People go look. <laughs> they get on Wikipedia immediately and they go, Sistine Chapel ceiling, <laughs> you know? So it's like insights like that can, can create interaction. They can create discussion. They can create connection. So sharing your insights, I think, is really important. And one of the things that um, I, I took a class from a guy named Tad Hargrave, Hargrave. And if you ever get a chance to take it, he lives up in Canada, but he does all of his stuff online. He has this thing called marketing for hippies and it's just brilliant but one of the things that he says is that one of the things that you've got that specifically your niche is your own unique point of view nobody else has it it is unique to you and it's valuable so if you're sharing your point of view your insights online there's value in that there's connection to be made through that instruction show your expertise i love that you're showing your work that's a wonderful thing but show people how you did it too honestly they're not going to steal it and if they are they really need a life <laughs> well and they're never going to do it the way you do it they'll never be able to match it so and and billy you were talking about when people come in and you show them how you do your sketches and your line drawings and stuff like that to start a to start a new painting I mean, that's brilliant. That gives them a sense of, you know, wow. So that's how that's done. You know? What's really fun to me is that it doesn't take away from the mystery. It doesn't. It's still mysterious to me how those paintings end up the way that they are. 
But now I can understand a little bit about the layers that go into it. Yeah, and I can get a real sense of, wow, this person has really worked hard to develop this craft, right? So instructional videos are really a great way to show your expertise and your expertise is important. And it's something that people really love and respect and connect with. And finally, one type of content that I think is important is the invitation. And the invitation I feel like is very often forgotten. And I think part of it is we've been kind of told not to toot our own horn. And we've been kind of told not to, you know, not to initiate things. We've been taught different things about interacting with people. And what I'm going to suggest is that you're probably going to be happier if you start inviting people more, more into your life than if you wait for them to take the action first. <coughs> so the way that this looks for me is um, many years ago now, it's, gosh, it's almost 10 years ago, um, I, I made a New Year's resolution. And the New Year's resolution was simply this. I was going to follow through with all of the people that I had said, we need to get a drink or coffee sometime. And I started, my, my New Year's resolution started with, I made a list of all of the people that I could remember that I had said that to. And ultimately it ended up being a hundred people. So for the next year, I scheduled two times a week where I would go out and have coffee with one of these people that I said, we should get together, right? Well, that invitation turned into one of the best years of business that I've ever had. Mm -hmm. And it's turned into a real rich network of friends and, and colleagues and connections throughout the community. And all it took was me initiating and inviting them to that. So the thing that I'll tell you is be thoughtful about your social media and see if there are ways that you can invite people to be a little bit more in your process, in your way of being, in your, you know, in your activities. And the more that you do that, the more inclined they're going to be to show up when you've got something even more valuable at stake. They'll be the ones that you can say, I'm having a reception on night on the town and it's at independence gallery and i would love it if you would come if you've invested in that if you've invited them throughout they're more inclined probably to take you up on that when it comes time for for the more for the more valuable commitment so when you're thinking about content think about different different things that you can put out there to people it doesn't have to be all all high value all the time, but it can be a variety of things, all right? Now, this is a good time for a break. Let's take a break. Do you mind stretching for five minutes and then coming back in? Got some snacks over there on the table right here. Oh, I'm hungry. <laughs> Need something to munch. Oh, you got the cookies. <laughs> I did lock the outside door, so if you need to get to your car, I just didn't want anyone wandering into the lobby while, you know, with the restaurants and stuff there, so. How are you, Ms. Billy? Good, how are you? So I had a new one I just tried in about a week ago, which actually maybe two weeks ago. Next one. Oh. I just posted a painting that I did on my devil's backbone, a hike I took. And that's basically what I said. The thing I just finished from a hike I took last spring. Yeah, I just, I did a, you know, it's John's town, it's not just, it's just John's town. 
but um, it's just a really so. So I started uh, it's a occasionally posting there. Yeah. Yeah. I have I have a yeah. bunch of patterns. Like I I now yeah. yeah. a lot actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a pattern. She's supposed to be back today. So it was twice in one week. I saw you. I saw you. What happened to a side conference? And then when I saw you, and then when I saw you, you come to the barber shop. Yeah. Well, that night we saw us cross the street. Not in the past. Oh, wow. What is it? All of them. So Dan had to show us the Yeah. Yes. the twins right And so now, But I'm learning still. Aren't we all? Oh, and then the new stuff up there today. You'll never be an expert. All right. Everybody ready to come back together? Is the most Oh, here's one of my dresses. Yeah. 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 I, yeah, the 40s or 60s were kind of my my genre that I, I stuck off most of my life. When you fit them properly to the body, and like, they became homeless too. This, this was gorgeous. So this was a Christmas quilt I made for my There's always that section to it, but we just came in and that's why I matched all of them. Got ready? Excellent. It's kind of hot in here. Usually it's cold. Are you? Right in the middle? No. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and get started. We've got a little bit more to cover. I was hoping to have a little bit of time. 
for questions and answers. Nah. I'll lose it if I raise it. Lisa, you seem like a really loud person. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Come on over. I don't know if you all on Zoom can still hear me, but here I am. I have no idea what's going on on Zoom right now. Yeah, they're up there on that screen. They're not on this screen. All right, everyone. One of the things that uh, that we talked about early on was that one of the biggest complaints about social media is the overwhelm that goes along with it. And one of the tools that I found that has helped me to eliminate almost all of my overwhelm with uh, content creation and posting is a tool called Canva. If you're not already familiar with it, I would encourage you to check it out. There are some others that are like it online. Um, I honestly don't have any kind of experience to say whether they're good or not. But um, Canva is one that I've been using now for several years. And the thing that I love about Canva is it already has pre-made templates for all social media platforms. The other thing that's really cool with Canva is that you can do branded content, which means that you can, you can upload your colors and your fonts and you can use your own branding uh, throughout Canva um, for your own uh, purposes. Well, last year they came up with a tool that made it worth paying extra for the pro account, and that is the content planner. I'm not going to do a demonstration that would take too much time. Again, we could do a whole workshop just on Canva and the content planner. But the thing that's really cool is that it's a calendar app, and you can pick the date on the calendar. You can choose what kind of a post you want to make. It will then open that post for you. You create that post, and then you have the option to schedule it. Now, one of the ways that I've my social media has been transformed is that I'm spending a lot less time from day to day on social media. I'm not getting on there 10 times a day. I'm getting on there twice a day, once in the morning and once in the afternoon. And the other way that I'm being active on social media is through automation and scheduling. Canva gives you the way to create and automate your social media posts. So the other thing that's kind of cool about that is that I can see a big view of all of my posts and the order that they go in and where they're going to show up and at what time. And I can be really intentional about how and when they show up. So like, let's say that I'm doing a campaign on LinkedIn and it's to promote my new uh, thing on um, podcasting for first time podcasters. And it's a five day educational uh, campaign. I can do all five of those posts. I can schedule them. I can create them one at a time in there. I can upload images, video, and now audio to include in those. And I can create all of my content right there on Canva and schedule it for release those five days at a specific time every day that I want it to show up. And that all can be done at one time instead of doing it five days in a row where I have to be on LinkedIn to do it. So what that's set up for me is that I can have a two hour time period at the beginning of the week where I can set up all of my social media posting for the week. Now I know some people that are doing their whole month and in some cases they're doing their whole quarter in advance using this content planner. It's a very powerful tool and it's something that I recommend everybody try out. Elizabeth. As far as like when you release your content, um, have you found like those high points for posting? Are those like really beneficial to you or does it really matter what time of day that you post? Because like I remember I would always try to post at a certain time every day and in the long run it didn't do anything for me. That also, those numbers fluctuate. Yeah. And the averages that they have, like if you go online and look for best time to post averages, 
those averages are over the course of a year. That doesn't tell you anything about the middle of March, you know? So it fluctuates throughout the year. What I usually say is to get into a rhythm, find your own rhythm. And one of the things that I like to do is to always choose a, a, a double number. So I'm gonna release this at 11, 11 every day this week, or I'm gonna release this at 12, 12, or I'm gonna release this at 8, 8, you know, whatever. But I, I try to be kind of cute that way, but it's just an inside joke. Nobody else knows but me, right? <laughs> yeah. It's one of those things. I just play it with the, you know, the, the numbers of the universe. Um, so I, the thing that I just want to reiterate is that if you can actually automate as much of your posting process as possible, it's going to take a lot off of your shoulders in terms of things that you have to stay aware of. And it helps you to consolidate your time. Like I said, if I spend two hours a week just scheduling, creating and scheduling my social media posts for the whole next week, I don't have to think about it again. And that has made a huge difference in my experience of social media. Yes. Like it's better than the business suite? Um, I hate the business suite. Okay, that answers the question. Yeah. <laughs> Why? The thing that I, there, there are two reasons that I just really don't like it at all. First of all, Facebook has a habit of fixing things that aren't broken. Yes. And Why? so what I'm going to say is that I know that I could get used to business suite today and next month, Facebook might get an itch that they don't want to do it anymore and they'll just ditch the whole thing. They do that all the time. So it's one of the things about being in on Facebook. It's like, if you get in the habit of doing something like using a, a specific feature, the one that I'll, I'll say right off the bat that they did away with this year that a lot of people felt the pain of was they used to have this thing called notes where people could actually create posts. Well, guess what they just started offering? Newsletters. Guess what newsletters are? Notes. Facebook giveth and Facebook taketh away. So I don't trust business manager. I don't think it's a really good thing uh, to get used to using with the exception of maybe checking your notifications on there. So with this one, you can, you can um, manage all of your platforms. I can see where you've got Pinterest and they're all there. And then that one, you can only do Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, that's so the other limitation. Broader. This one, I can post to YouTube. I can post to LinkedIn. I can post to Pinterest. It does now post to TikTok. <laughs> you can't post to Clubhouse, so it's not, that's not relevant. But, um, but this, this tool has transformed my uh, experience of social media in ways that I can't be anything but glowing about. It's like 10 bucks a month. I have a question. Yeah. So, so as far as scheduling, um, one of the things that I like, I like to do with my Instagram stuff is I like to do my hashtags like in a comment. Yeah. That this scheduler, like you basically like if you wanted to get the most engagement, you'd have to basically go in right after a post and then do your comments. So, is that what I should just do, or do you think should I just go ahead and put the hashtags in the caption? Well, here's the way that I would treat it, Amelia. What what I feel like is that in your, in your captions on Instagram, the question is about hashtags in the comment. You can't, you can't do comments from Canva. That's just not a possibility at this point. But one of the things that's really interesting is that there, there's a series of hashtags that you have that I would call branded hashtags that are specific to you. They might help you to organize things in a collection. They might help you know you to put things together in a way that people can recognize your work um, those are the ones that i would make sure are in every caption and then make your make your comment ones you'd have to go back and do it yeah but make your comment ones the more specific to the piece make sense yeah. is there a way to copy, copy and paste those that's what i do yeah i do from what i understand um 
You do need to switch those hashtags around though, because the algorithm will know what you're doing. Yeah. And it's like, it no, that's not okay. This is not organic. It know? notices repetition. So yeah, you do have to be careful. Yeah. But um, um, you could do it in different order. Yeah. Um, and I switch it. You can switch them up, like just change them to the team. Bit. Yeah. So what I do is I have like Microsoft sticky notes on my computer. And I have um, probably five, six little sticky notes, and each one of them is a hashtag list. And I can copy and paste it. I can move them around. Um, I think Instagram now allows 30 hashtags on your caption, and then you can put more in the comments. I don't like to have 30 hashtags anywhere. <laughs> um, but on, on anything that will allow me to do hashtags or or search labels or things like that. I try to keep as much of that copy and pasteable as possible because that's just a really good time saver. One thing I was going to say, I've, I've done it both ways. I've done you know, just posting every day yeah. and I've done scheduling them. Uh, and, and I think so much of it, it's, it's good to try both because depending on your rhythm, depending on how you like to use social media um, and what you like to post about, and, and everything like scheduling could be amazing for you, but it may feel stifling for others. Yeah. And so just just try them both and see what but try it for like a while. Try it for like a couple months to really see what feels best. Because if you don't find something that you really like the that if you don't find a way you like to do it, guess what's gonna happen? You're not gonna do it. That's right. So so just be aware of that. Yeah, the thing that I I was telling Billy, I don't, I will never consider myself a social media expert. The social media won't let let you be an expert for very long. <laughs> um, so the thing that's really interesting is that I spend probably as much time testing things on social media as I do, you know, knowing anything. Um, so testing and learning is a really good thing to to go into it with a you know an open mind, open attitude. So that, that, that's the end of my pitch for Canva. Kat, did you have one? Yeah, the only other um, thing, and especially since we're talking artists here, if you're using the Adobe Creative Suite and you have the full license, yeah. Adobe Spark can also create really good graphics and is also has a lot of the same oh, yeah. functionality as Canva. Um, and if you have any stock photos from Adobe Stock, you can incorporate those into your posts too. Yeah. Um, but it does not, as far as I know, have the wonderful content calendar. Not that yet. Canva gets you for the page, and it's, it's a lot more expensive. For it won't be long. <laughs> it is a standalone tool, but for the graphics creation part of it, it's it's definitely a good tool. If you've already got Creative Suite, Spark is a great thing. They also have templates that you can download for all the social media, for Photoshop, Illustrator, mm -hmm. um, InDesign, and one other. Uh, premiere you can do uh, like different size videos so anyhow content planning let's talk about the viral spiral <laughs> how algorithms work so the algorithm is not a static thing it's a learning thing an algorithm is a machine learning and what that means is that it's paying attention to things that are happening um, online. So the way that it works is that it starts with my post. This is a recent post that I put up for a video interview that I did with someone. What happens is I get likes, comments, and shares on that post. If I don't get any likes, comments, and shares on that post, it dies a very fast death. <laughs> But if I get a handful of likes, comments, and shares, it gets another, it gets another round of views. So more people see it. If it gets more likes, comments, and shares, it gets more views. If it gets more likes, comments, and shares, it gets more views. If it gets more likes, comments, and shares, it gets more views and so on and so on 
So the thing that's really interesting is that the algorithm is a smart thing. And what it's really designed to do for the user is to create a better experience for you. So it's paying attention to the things that you do like. And it's paying attention to the things that you do comment on. And it's paying attention to the things that you share because it wants to show you more of those things, right? So actually, I don't look at the algorithm as the scary monster that everybody says it is. I look at it as a friendly monster. <laughs> and the thing is, is that uh, just like any monster, it has dislikes and likes. What the algorithm dislikes are posts that are just text by itself. And even on Medium, you can't post just text by itself and have it go anywhere. The algorithm doesn't like single images without captions. These tend to have a very short life. Photos with too much text in the image are also, they've loosened the, the ropes on this. It used to be that you couldn't have more than 20% of your image be text. Now it's probably closer to 60 or 70%. But even so, if they see too much text in your photo, they'll, they'll bury it. No copyrighted material. Now, there are people that try to get around this, but don't use copyrighted images, don't use copyrighted audio, don't use copyrighted video. Music. Yeah, the, the music will get you shut down right quick, and nobody will see what you're doing if you use copyrighted material. Now, they're finding ways, more and more ways to identify copyrighted material uh, through machine learning. So just don't do it. Use original material. So with that included, I use on a um, you know, video editor on a Dell. Yeah. And they have music that you can put as the background. That's called royalty free music and it's allowed. Okay. So that yeah. is not following those questions. Yeah. Royalty free music is music that's made for that purpose and it's available and you can get free uh, music on Facebook, you can get free music on YouTube. And you can get it from probably three dozen other places in a Google search, um, in addition to the places that have paid subscriptions for it. Don't do what my seven year old does, which is basically keep the recording and something he hears on Amazon yeah. music and then adds it to his videos. Now, he's not selling anything, but, <laughs> but that's basically using copyrighted music. <laughs> but even imagery now is starting to be found that they'll be able to recognize paintings and photographs that are famous and things like that. Last year, one of the studio tour artists um, got caught with this, and um, he paints uh, sports cars and put oh, a clip yeah. of uh, "Get Your Motor Running" uh, with it and right when they opened off, yeah. up the video, and they shut it down within probably five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I saw it post, and then I got an email. <laughs> so they actually can yeah. shut it down now instantly before it's even posted. So. Yeah, just don't do it. Yeah. Well, you don't even. We don't know. You don't think about it. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't think about it either. My grandmother used to say, "Too much of a good thing is a bad thing." So the same thing goes for hashtags and tags. If you're putting too many hashtags and tags on your post, people actually don't read in between them. So I, I try to be really sparing about that. And I, and I like the idea of putting hashtags in comments if you can, and I actually put links in comments now, because I think that more people are going to stick with the message if there's not a bunch of clutter in there. Now, the one kind of clutter that they do allow is emojis. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they actually seem to like it. Um, I'll play along. All right, something just happened again, Kat. Oh, I did have a quick question. Okay. About the photos with too much text in the image. How can you know if there's too much yeah, text in the image? Like, is there a well, character count? Or... It's not a character count. It's space. That's so, hard. well, think about it. If, you, if you've got an image this size, and that much of it is text, that's too much. 
There's so, no image. It's like there's nothing to see except text. Just make sure it's under 50%. Um, I would I would even shoot for less than that if you can and, and see if you can get people to actually read the caption. Boring content. <laughs> if if nobody is interacting with it. No. Not so much. It does search for words like it, it, it searches for words like like. It's it, it searches for like, comment, and share, and it doesn't like those very much. So one of the things that you can do is tell me what you think, or um, uh, what's your reaction to this post. Right. Yeah. But don't tell people to like, comment, and share. Right. Now, most of the platforms don't like off-platform links. So if you're if you are posting a YouTube video on Facebook and you put the YouTube link, Facebook probably won't let many people see that. If you're linking to your website, they're a little bit kinder about that. But if it's if it's going to a competitor, they'll shuffle it under the rug as quick as day. Right. What if it's going to that little? Well, that's where I usually invite people to click on the blue button. And I'll just say, if you click on the blue button up underneath my cover photo, it'll take you right to this place. I don't put the link tree in my post because it's an off platform link too. The only thing that you can do is that you can actually put Facebook links into Facebook posts and they'll actually boost it. <laughs> Well, their whole goal is to keep you on their platform because at their heart, they're all Yeah. Algorithm loves it when people share things. So if you share a post that gives like maximum approval to the algorithm, so the more that a post gets shared, the more it's going to be seen by a lot of people. The algorithm likes interaction and discussion, and the way that it sees that is when people are involved back and forth in discussions in the comments. So if like I'm having a discussion with somebody and we have an interchange with we each go four times, then the algorithm is going to notice that and more people are going to see that post as a result. The algorithm loves live video on almost all of the platforms. Um, the only one that really could care less is Twitter, but Twitter doesn't care about anything. <laughs> I think people who really enjoy Twitter, there's something weird about them. <laughs> yes. No. Live video is right. You know, you pick up your phone, you go on Facebook and you click the live button and you and you're on. Right. So live video is something that all of them are loving right now. And Instagram and Facebook are at the top of that list. YouTube's not very far off the top of that list because they really like live video now as well. Yep, it'll post it. It'll it'll record it and post it as a replay later on, which is a nice benefit. So that you want, I do it want it saved. But yeah. I made that mistake where I haven't saved it and then I can use it for nothing else. Now, one of the things of, about it is that, as far as I can tell, Facebook is pushing that live video feature into the business manager more and more. I don't know that they're going to continue to allow us to do it just from our news feed. God help us. <laughs> I think because software developers are the smartest idiots I know. <laughs> so another thing that uh, algorithms love is stories, reels, and shorts. Stories are those little uh, uh, vertical things that you see on uh, on Facebook at the top of the page, right? It's the first thing that you see. And if you can get your story in the first three or four stories, a lot more people are going to see it. And it'll be the first thing that they see. And if you roll over it, you can start seeing things move and captions pop up and everything like that. 
So they're only there for 24 hours unless you archive them. So, and reels on Instagram are very similar, very short videos that uh, vertical format. Um, they're kind of, TikTok is that, that on steroids. And then YouTube just introduced shorts, which is the same thing. Um, nobody can have an original idea around here, but they all really like them right now. Photo albums and collections. On Facebook, if you're going to be posting photos, I suggest that you start using albums rather than your timeline. The reason for that is when you post photos on your timeline, they get seen once. And if nobody interacts with them during that trip, they don't get seen again. If you post your photos to an album, every time that you post to that album, Anybody who's interacted with that album in the past is going to be notified that there are new pictures to see in it, and it's going to show up in their timeline. So in addition to that, there may have been photos that they missed, but when they open the album, there they are, and they see them. So if you're not using photo albums on Facebook, it's the best thing that I have ever seen for people who share photos there. Now, the thing that I love to do on that is to share four photos at a time. And the reason for that is because Facebook will show four photos at a time. If you only show one photo, again, it's not that interesting, but if you show four photos, all of a sudden you've got a story in those four frames, right? So use photo albums on Facebook and on Instagram, use the collections where is that the one where you scroll side to side what, what is, is it called carousel carousel so, so basically that's right you just hit multiple yes and then you can select several yeah because think about it how often when you're when you're on instagram think about yourself as a consumer if there's like if there's a little thing that says that there's more photos you know you're gonna look at all of them yeah so and so that helps now the other thing that i like to tell artists to do is to take multiple pictures of the same piece, but from different parts of it. So if you think about your piece in a grid and you do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, reveal, you've got 10 pictures, right? Now, remember what I said earlier about one of the things that happens is that if people spend more time looking at your artwork, meaning the chances that they'll buy something increase. That's not to say that it's gonna work every time, but it, your, your odds get higher if they're spending more time looking at details of the work. So you could set up a carousel where you're going through the grid. And reveal, and guess what's in the caption of the reveal? This piece is for sale, Fine Art America. Look at my Linktree link in the description to go right there. So you can be really creative about how you use albums and carousels. And I encourage you to just experiment with it and see where your imagination can take you because those can give people a really good experience of what you do. Um, Facebook, especially right now, and Instagram both like video series. Um, these can be both in regular video form or they can be in story form. I don't know if you've noticed the series in stories where it bounces from one video to another to another and then to an image and then to another video. It's like you can string together a bunch of these in, in a series in line. And you can also do the same thing in Facebook video is that you can create an autoplay playlist that goes through your videos in order. And it can, you can really string together a lot of shorter videos to tell a longer story and keep people engaged. So the algorithm loves those tags and hashtags in moderation. Now, remember that tags, too many tags give the algorithm heartburn. But if you can, if you can use them wisely, and like I said, if you can kind of separate it out, the way that I like to separate my hashtags is I like to have some that are branded that are specific to me. I like to have some that are about the specific piece that I just posted. And then I like to have others that organize things in collections. So as an artist, let's say that you've got the summer collection 2021. You have a hashtag that says hashtag Elizabeth summer 2021. Right. 
And that, that's the thing that organizes all of those photos together uh, so that people can easily find the collection. Now, one of the things that's really fun, especially on Instagram, is that hashtags can be followed. Mm -hmm. So if people follow a hashtag, guess what shows up in their timeline? Pictures that have that hashtag. So use hashtags and, and do a search on Instagram just to see what hashtags come up, because the, the ones that come up on top are the ones that everybody's using. Yours, your posts could come up you know, in a really popular place. Still, there's still a chance for you. <laughs> so, Franklin, yes. one question. I was curious on your take on, like, the uses of the hashtags as far as, like, I've heard some people say, like, you know, if you have, um, I don't know, like a thousand followers, try to use only hashtags that are, like, 10K to 100K usage type of thing. Yeah. Like, I didn't know if you had any thoughts or information on because like if you're if you're using a ton of hashtags that have millions of hits on them or or whatever like more likely that you get buried not necessarily okay. the thing that happens is that like if you go to instagram on the search you'll notice that you've got popular and latest okay. categories the popular one is the ones that are most popular over time which means they've had the most views if you go to the latest, it shows you the ones that have happened in the most recent minutes. And you can find trends that are going on in that category. So the thing that I would look at is that I don't really, I don't need to have millions of people find me, but it'd be really nice if thousands did, you know? So there are also tools that you can get called hashtag scrapers. Sometimes they're useful, sometimes they're not. The best one that I found is by a guy named Jim Edwards. Um, and he is, uh, he's got a lot of really cool scrapers and wizards for, uh, for tags and hashtags and social media marketing. Um, so, Jim Edwards. So the last thing that I'll say that feed the algorithm is the algorithms love emojis, gifts, and feelings. You notice on uh, Facebook that Cat Heart is feeling tired right now. <laughs> and there will be this little, this little emblem that right? So what's really funny is that if you tried to do the same post, and you include those things in your post, your views go, your views are higher an idea like basically look at look at your information like take a post that yeah. oh, didn't do so great do the exact same thing but add the stuff that you talked about just as an experiment and see yeah see well the other thing is that these kind these types of images are actually what are called scroll stoppers and a scroll stopper is anything that catches the person's attention that makes that interrupts their normal way of doing things and makes them stop and look even for a moment these kinds of images are scroll stoppers. And in, I'm gonna be doing another workshop uh, on brand messaging, and we're gonna talk about scroll stoppers more in detail in that workshop. But um, these images are things that stop the scroll. And that's one of the reasons that the algorithm loves it so much is because when people see a GIF, which is that little you know, three frame video that shows the kid dancing, you know, <laughs> I hope that doesn't turn into a gift. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but those those things stop people and they they catch their their attention long enough for them to stop scrolling. And the algorithm favors that. So those feelings like on Facebook, you can say tired. Yeah. Like if, if you go to on Facebook, there's this little thing that says add to post or add. And when you click on that, one of the things that you can do is you can choose how you're feeling in that moment. Does check-ins do anything? Check-ins are great. They're a location tag. Mm -hmm. Check-ins are a location tag. And that shows up on the locations page as well. Okay. So check-ins are great. Location tags are an important tag just as much as account tags are. All right. Social pods, the last thing I'd like to talk about. 
this is kind of a brand new thing that I've just been hearing about in the last few months. And I think it's a brilliant wow. thing. And I'm going to encourage you all to think about doing this for Studio Tour. The Social Pod is a group of people. And what they make is a commitment to each other to show up. They meet on a social platform at the same time each week. They post content that needs maximum visibility during that time. And then they spend that time, usually an hour, liking, commenting on, and sharing each other's posts soon after they post it. Algorithm loves them. I've seen it done in a number of ways. The way that I liked the best was a, a group meets on Zoom. And they share links in the chat. And they go to each other's posts and they like, comment, and share them. And the thing is, is that that group is almost 200 people large. And there's, no, there's not a cap on it except for how many Zoom will allow. Um, this is a, a remarkably smart way to position your posts for greater visibility right off the bat. And so the algorithm is going to see a really big push in the beginning. So what that means is that early on, a lot more people are going to see the post. A lot more reactions are going to be able to be gained. And the, the post has a much bigger chance of reaching a much wider audience. So the social pod is a new idea. I've just been hearing about it lately. But one of the things that I think would be a really cool possibility would be to organize some of these as you get closer to studio tour. And you just say, you know, this group of artists is going to do a social pod on Facebook. We're going to meet together for an hour on this day on Zoom. And we're just going to be posting our, our high visibility posts that we need high visibility for. And we're going to be liking, commenting, and sharing on each other's posts during that hour. Right? This could be done several times between now and studio tour. And that increases the awareness and the visibility of studio tour. And it increases the awareness and, vis and invisibility of your participation in it. And it increases the awareness and visibility of your relationships with each other. All of those things are important to the algorithm and they're important to your community. So I think that this is, if there was one thing that I was going to say that you leave here tonight wanting to do, it's to create a social pod for your, for your studio tour program. Is that cool? Well, and think about the intention and the impact of the posts that you're sharing and to tie this all back to that first circle or to that first grid that Franklin was talking about. When you're doing those social pods, really focus on some of that, that high impact, um, high intention content to get that interaction around those really, you know, stellar posts that you have to share. Yeah. Oh, well, I already talked about the result. This just drives it home. <laughs> More favorable placement, higher visibility, and higher interaction. All of those goals that we wanted, right? And higher impact. Next steps, I got three for you. First one is to send Kat an email and tell us, which one of these things that you learned in the class that you'll use immediately? Accountability. <laughs> you can send it to me too. That's more likely to answer. Um, schedule a regular LBD or schedule regular LBDC consulting appointments to review your social media strategy, content, and performance. Hey, guess who you can meet with as an LBDC consultant? Franklin. <laughs> it's so easy and it's so free. <laughs> do it do just schedule it like once a quarter that's usually what i recommend yeah. to people it's like once every three or four months like schedule an appointment and we can just we can review how things are going and we can kind of brainstorm if we need to we can come up with really cool strategies if we need to we can tie things in with your website etc cetera, etc cetera. 
but we're, we've got a resource here that there's no reason not to do it. I want you to watch for the evaluation in your inbox and let us know how we can improve this show and other things that you'd like to learn. Those are the three next steps. Cool. Now I've got this resource page and um, Kat, do you want me to take on the distribution of the slides? Um, I can send this out to everyone, both online and uh, in person. So. so Kat will send this out so that you can see some of the resources that are available. There are so many resources and so little time. I just found some of the ones that I like the best and uh, shared them here. Um, like I said, there's no one in the world that's a social media expert because social media doesn't like that. Even people who work at the platforms aren't experts on them. <laughs> so like I said, I'd introduce myself at the end. This is me. All right. I know we've gotten past time now. I know that we've got to shut things down soon. Are there any other questions? We've covered a lot of ground. I know that it probably is overwhelming. I have a tendency to go that way. You're so gentle about it. I don't want it to hurt. <laughs> so one thing we were talking about um, as uh, Jill and I, with working with the, the studio tour board, is the idea of doing a private Facebook group um, so that we can um, kind of digest some of this information from our trainings. Like if we're going to keep coming to our trainings, we can keep, you know, keep the conversation going. And um, that's potentially, like, we'll share it via email as well, um, as far as doing um, a, a social pod and all of that. But I do think having a private Facebook group might be a perfect resource hub for us and a way to kind of share our knowledge. Like some of the things that I was writing down, like we can put together a link tree tutorial. We can teach you how to do that. We can teach you how to use Canva. That's where we can also talk, like everyone has such great ideas for offers. Well, maybe that's where we can share a whole bunch of those offer ideas. Definitely. We can share our stories what worked, what fell flat on its face, <laughs> that you don't want anyone else to try. You know, like, it just might be helpful to have that type of networking, uh, resource sharing, and also that sense of, oh my gosh, we're not alone. We're, we can help each other at this. So um, that's kind of what, I mean, does that sound like something you guys? Sure. I, I would like, I definitely like the idea of the card, the social card, mm -hmm. um, especially our Facebook is only up for a month, so. Okay. Ready there. Hi, Zoomers. Joan, you've hung in there the whole time. That's really good. Yeah, and Corey as well. Thank you all for being here. Was there anything in the chat that we needed to cover there? Did you watch that? All right, we're good. Thank you, Joan. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye. Great, everyone. Watch for the slides. Okay, great. Thanks.